One of my favorite gospel stories in John is the account of the healing of the man who was born blind. In the ninth chapter of John, we read a story who has been uh, about a man who has been blind from birth, and Jesus, according to the narrative, heals him. But of course, he does it on a Sabbath, which creates tension in the way John tells the story. So there was a religious violation in doing something good, and so there's an argument that ensues. But the part that I really love is when the religious leaders get this man alone, and he spent his entire life being blind, and now he can see, and they ask him, where is the one who healed you? And he says, I don't know. I love that. The way that John tells the story, Jesus is able to give this man a gift of immeasurable value, completely transforms his life, takes away his disability, gives his life back to him, sets him free, but he sets him free not only of the disability, he sets him free of any obligation. There's no ties because Jesus has given him this great gift. Jesus then walks away and leaves the man free to go and do whatever it is that he wishes that he could have been doing for the last 30 years. He gave him a gift and let him be free. It is the freedom that attracts me to this passage from Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. Now, I have to say, everybody has feelings about poets that are uh, different. He wrote in both English and Arabic, and he uh, was an immigrant to the United States, and some people absolutely love him, and some people absolutely can't stand him. And I can say, honestly, I'm both. Uh, I love this passage and can't stand a lot of what he does that seems like fairly shallow sophistry. But this passage about children, I've never been able to get out of my head. His suggestion that we should not make our children little replicas of ourselves, because ultimately our children do not belong to us. They belong to the future. We give them life. We care for them when they're sick. We feed and house them. We protect them when they're young. And we evidently worry about them for the rest of our lives but we do not own them. And if we are good parents, they will leave us without the feeling that they owe us anything at all. I hope that my daughter continues to visit me frequently in the future, but I do not demand it of her. And I fully accept that if I really want to, in a healthy way, make the transformation from being a parent to being a friend, that I also have an obligation to be a good and interesting friend. I need to let go of any control. Uh, I need to learn how to be sparing with giving advice and to be enjoyable when we are together. I will do my best not to burden her as I grow old and I will strive to leave her enough of an estate to make a difference in her life, but there is no contract between the two of us. Now what we have is love and memories, but not a contract, no obligation, no debt to be paid. She has told me not to worry about my retirement, that when the time comes that she'll just move me into her house and take care of me, but I don't know that she hasn't promised her mother the same thing, and I just can't go through that again. So. <laughs> but I digressed. But talk about setting your children free into the future without tying them to the past has some real implications. The religious and the non-religious, the conservative and the liberal, all appear to have passionate feelings about children, specifically about babies. But opinions without personal sacrifice is really just a springboard into hypocrisy. Honey, that is fine. It's her day. She can cry all she wants to. Don't, don't be self-conscious about it. The 19th century American evangelist Alexander Campbell said that if you're willing to get down on your knees and pray for something, that you are not also willing to stand up and work for and sacrifice for, what you're doing is not only going to be a disappointment to yourself, but ultimately it is an insult to God. For the past 40 years, we've been vigorously debating whether or not a woman should have a right to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. 
The religious right joined arms with Roman Catholic leadership in condemning abortion under virtually all circumstances. And while those of us on the left have been inclined to support a woman's right to govern her reproductive life, we have tried to call our sisters and brothers on the right side of the spectrum onto the common ground of supporting children after they're born with good schools and access to health care. This is a conversation that we've had tremendous difficulty getting started. In fact, a decade ago, I published a column in which I pointed out that the abortion rate went down by more than 50% during the Clinton administration, not because there were restrictive laws about abortion, but because of low unemployment and rising wages. When women believe that it is economically possible for them to properly care for a child, then abortion becomes a much less attractive option. Under economic hardship, it becomes much more common. Conservative administrations try to make abortion illegal and if they can't do that, they try to make it nearly impossible to obtain. Now in the state of Missouri, we have only one abortion provider for the entire state, for the whole state of Missouri, and it is in St. Louis. And we have added a 72 hour waiting period that would require a woman from Springfield or Kansas City or Northern Missouri to make this four or 500 mile round trip, spend three nights in St. Louis, to be able to exercise her legal rights. So I pointed out in this column that it is one thing to make life hard on the poor, but it is another, another to actually do something that actually reduces the abortion rate, which is raising the standard of living of women with children. Conservatives pay lip service to the value of human life while fostering the economic circumstances that make abortion happen more often. Now, I've received a lot of hate mail in response to my columns over the years, but that column is the only one that inspired a lengthy bit of hate mail, several pages of handwritten letter from a Catholic nun. And, and you have to know that life's going to take kind of a hard turn on the day when you open a letter from a nun who hates you and is willing to say it. But I have to say, that Sister Mary Elephant certainly had some talent with a poison pen. We may never all agree on the moral issues around reproductive decision making, but if we cannot agree on making the personal and social sacrifices necessary to give a newborn child access to health care, decent housing, and an opportunity to obtain a good education in a safe school, then the rest of the conversation is just smoke and mirrors hiding selfish hypocrisy. And I assume I really don't have to say more about that to you. Gibran talks about our children being the future and that sentiment is really being driven home. It, was, it hit me hard this week when I found out that Chile has decided to make college tuition free. Chile! And they are doing it by adding a 24% tax to corporations that operate in Chile. Now, I was jealous when I heard that Germany was going to make their colleges tuition free. I was jealous. Allowing the children of the poor to receive the same education as the children of the middle and upper classes is a vote for the future of the nation. In Germany, it was logical. Germany is the most successful, economically successful country in Europe right now, and they want to remain very competitive in the European and in the global market. But Chile is a very poor nation that is not competitive at all, which is why it makes even more sense for them to sacrifice to subsidize the education of their college kids. Chile is deciding that they want to be the next first world economic power. And they are doing it by liberating their children from the hurdle that keeps them out of college or the student debt that makes life after college nearly impossible. Both ends of the spectrum, Chile and Germany, are sacrificing for their children. You should already know, but I'm going to state it for the record, that this is the opposite of what we are doing in the United States. We are cutting education budgets 
in both our state and federal budgets so that the cost of going to college is constantly rising, making it prohibitive to all but the economically secure. And as my next girlfriend, Elizabeth Warren, has been ardently pointing out, we're not only not helping our college students to go to school, we are burdening them with the high interest rate on student loans so that we can make a profit off of them. Now look, Elizabeth, if you watch my videos, I just want to be clear, I don't want this to get weird. I know you're happily married, I was just joking. But every day, our government loans money to our huge banks at nearly 0% interest. The government loans money to banks so that they can then use that money to make a profit and to stimulate the economy. But our students, our lower income, lower middle and middle class students who borrow money to go to college, their interest rates on their student loans are set to double to be more than 6% later this summer. We, we all know people whose student loan payment is higher than their house note. And that fact alone often makes young couples look at each other and decide they cannot even afford to have a child. They cannot afford to become a family because they will be paying off their student loans for longer than they ought to be in their childbearing years. Germany and Chile are investing heavily in their young people's education while our government is currently making a profit <coughs> more than 50 billion dollars a year that we are exacting from the poor and the middle class students. And so far, our Congress has even refused to allow those students the right to refinance. If you had to take out those loans to go to school and you have the opportunity to refinance at a lower interest rate, they won't let you because the government is using our children as a source of income, as if we do not believe that America has a future. Look, around here we talk about evidence-based faith. We talk about a spirituality that is supposed to matter in the real world. So we need to get honest about how our talk and how our actions don't look like each other when it comes to children. Our children are the future, and so we owe them a shot at a decent future that, that takes more than just telling them that we love them. It takes doing something that changes the nature of the world they're going to grow up into. Here in Missouri, we have some things we really need to do. We need to expand Medicaid so that all children have access to health care, and we need to do it now. We need to adequately fund our schools, which means paying teachers enough to keep good people in those positions. Amen. We need to make our colleges and universities tuition free, and we need to make student loans at a 0% interest rate. Amen. We need to shut off this insane school to prison pipeline. We need to decriminalize nonviolent drug users and put resources behind addiction treatment rather than incarceration in which we saddle young kids with a lifelong criminal record. In short, we need to stop stealing their future before they get out of preschool. Amen. Now, Now these may sound like big agendas. You may feel like these things are out of your grasp. But in a democracy, exactly whose grasp are they in? If our kids are to have a future, we have to stop saying that we care and we have to start acting like we care, which includes voting as if it matters, because I suspect that it does. <laughs> You have been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.